so guys i'm starting awesome so thank thanks for everyone for joining uh, today on a saturday and it's a great weather to speak about uh, any any technical events so now the title of the stock is template oriented program to ship faster uh, if you go ahead and google about template oriented programming uh, you won't find anything because this is a term that i have coined uh, my intention behind that and uh, the gauntlet uh, underneath is I have used it because I was trying to uh, represent the template. Uh, the gauntlet itself is like a template. And then if you fill all of its blank with all the infinity stones, you get all the super parts. So we're gonna do something uh, similar to that, wherein uh, we write a code which, is, which represents a template. And then we're gonna fill its missing pieces so that it can be reused across different paradigms. Again, uh, we'll slowly get there and uh, before starting the session, let me introduce myself. I'm Gopal. I'm a software engineer at Salesforce. And this is my Twitter handle and my website uh, where I blog about uh, uh, a lot of stuff. So if you want to follow, you can follow me there. So uh, disclaimer before starting. So this is an a, a intermediate to advanced talk, basically. But I, since this is our first meetup and uh, I really uh, want to start at uh, a, a level where a lot of us are comfortable. So I'll start really with the basics. Uh, with that said, uh, we'll be more focusing on the why and how part and less on the what part. What I mean is why why in the sense, why do we actually need this technique, uh, template oriented programming? And how, how are the pieces actually fit together? But the what part is actual code low level code, which we are not gonna really focus on this session because uh, this stuff is a little hard and uh, it's really difficult to grasp in one hour uh, while the session is going on. So I would request you not to like stress yourself on low level details and just sit back and relax. This is already being recorded and uh, I'm gonna share all the code samples and uh, the slide deck as well so that you can offline connect all the dots uh, but in meanwhile, if you have any any doubt, please feel free to interrupt me. You can keep your mics on all the time if you don't have any background noise. Uh, it feels a lot better for a speaker uh, because silence is more intimidating than FP. <laughs> so if coming to FP, how many of you know FP? Uh, you guys can speak up probably if you have any knowledge on FP or opinion about FP. Or you're already doing that in your work. P means functional programming. Right, functional programming. Okay, so I'm using my uh, code. Yeah, <clears throat> I have used uh, FP a uh, little bit in little bit in Scala. Great, yeah. great. Uh, Scala developers will find it very easy to follow because a lot of the things I speak about are coming from Scala. To Kotlin ecosystem, uh, so which is awesome. And then I'll just start with the ones who don't know just why should we actually learn FP? Surely it's not because it's cool. Of course it's cool, but not we don't learn that just because it's cool or we can do some awesome things with that. There is real advantage of learning FP. Uh, it actually changes the way you think. Uh, uh, you must have heard it said a lot of times and but no one must have told you how it actually changes your thinking or thinking about coding. Uh, there may be a reason for that. It's because uh, you have to feel it for yourself. The ones who has already are, or have done it or are doing it uh, can relate to that. Uh, you have to, uh, even there is a joke about it, once you understand Monats, you, you know, lose the power of explaining about it. But the actual part is, it's just like asking uh, probably Air Rahman, how can you compose such great tunes? So he might just answer you saying, uh, learn music, but that's not the answer what you're looking for, right? So once you actually have the uh, tool set and once your brain grasps all those, uh, the ways to actually orchestrate these things, you would feel the power of uh, actually writing code in the form of maths, uh, like maths equations and derivations. Uh, even the code, code is just like uh, uh, we do a lot of transformations, like we go from A to B and B to C, C to D, et cetera, right? But the problem is most of us uh, kind of look at code in a different way, mostly because we start with an imperative background. Even I started with an imperative background. 
And uh, a lot of the times we try to do it in low level, uh, using low level constructs like if else, for loop, whatever the language has given out of the box. But uh, when you see this code as design patterns, we know design patterns in loops that all of us have studied uh, are, being, are implementing on a day-to-day -day basis and also use it as a vocabulary to share among uh, each other. Uh, oops, uh, design patterns mostly talk about how you construct your classes, uh, how you should design those pieces, etc. But functional patterns talk about the low level part wherein how you should write your functions or how you should compose them, how you should uh, uh, write the most basic level. Let me give you an example. Imagine you have a you have a for loop, you have a list of things, and you want to loop through them to aggregate something. Normally, we start with uh, a for loop and have a temporary variable into which we aggregate things, and then uh, we get the aggregation in the end. And that's called fold in functional programming. Uh, ha has anyone used fold? Uh, it's it's coming out of the box in Kotlin, not in Java, but Kotlin list has a fold function. Has anyone used it? Okay, yes, you can always speak up. <laughs> I feel a uh, little intimidated when I hear silence, if I'm even being heard or not. I have not used uh, Fold in, in Kotlin because I'm just starting with it. Okay. But I used, uh, of course, I have used Core, no? Uh, used that, uh, yeah, yeah it's not language specific, of course. Uh, uh, yeah, if yeah. you have used it in any uh, okay. language, yeah, you understand what, yeah. how, how powerful it yeah. is. So in the yeah. end, uh, what happens is when you start uh, recognizing these patterns and uh, actually when you are good at uh, what uh, what fp dictionary says about that particular pattern like just like this fold uh, your code really becomes concise becomes concise it's like a four is to one ratio you can almost replace four lines of your code with just one line in functional programming but what does that get us you know that gets us a high quality bug free code why am i saying that it's high quality bug free because uh, if you are depending on the constraints that are coming out of a language or a well-tested library, it removes the need for you to unit test a lot of things. A lot of things are coming out of the box uh, and you can rely on them just to, again, you can just orchestrate those things so that uh, your, your code, the actual code that you are writing becomes really lean. So this is, this is a big benefit, uh, especially when it comes to enterprise software where we spend a lot of time fixing bugs or finding bugs. And it becomes so expressive. Uh, like I said, it becomes like a shared vocabulary. The moment you write small, concise code, it reads like an English sentence. Anyone who has written would be knowing it. And uh, it becomes like a shared vocabulary. A peer who also knows about it uh, can easily review a code. Uh, it doesn't have to go into nitty gritty things or uh, nitpick this is what is going on in the if else condition or for loop, all that stuff. So with that said, we're not going to talk about functional programming today. Uh, you can find a lot of books and a lot of articles and a lot of uh, tutorials about why this is good, why when this should be used and other things. I would leave you to explore more going there. Uh, surely some uh, we'll be doing today is we actually take a real world problem and then we try to solve it in an elegant fashion using functional programming constructs. But before getting there, let me start with something pretty basic. Anyone heard about this term monomorphic? Uh, a monomorphic code, let me start with an example. How many of you have written algorithms to sort, uh, bubble sort, quick sort, and all that stuff? Pretty much everyone must, must be having, must be doing that in our colleges as well as preparing for the interviews, right? So. Most of the times we use uh, integer data type uh, for our sorting algorithms. Even that's what they ask in the interviews. But have you thought how can you make use of the same sorting algorithm to sort strings? Can anyone uh, guess uh, how can we do that? Imagine you have written a quick sort algorithm for uh, sorting integers. Can you make use of it to also sort strings? And what is stopping you and what is uh, what you need to do? Any idea? Most of the times, uh, we, if we uh, are not aware of what I'm going to say, we, we end up rewriting the code for uh, string sorting again, right? 
So this is the problem with monomorphic code. The monomorphic code is stick to one data type. Uh, it can't be like reused for other data types. Let me start with the polymorphic uh, code. So, but before that, let's start. What are the types of polymorphisms, right? Uh, we all know one polymorphism, uh, which is pretty pretty popular, subtype with inheritance, right? Uh, we all do it day to day, wherein you have an interface or an abstract class, and you have multiple implementations, and then you do you choose one in the runtime. It's pretty popular, and then we have parametric uh, polymorphism, wherein a list of t. This is also pretty popular, wherein a list can hold both an integer as well as a string, and that's like polymorphic as well. There is a third one which is not so popular, but then we all use it on a regular basis. But I'll prove it. It's called ad hoc polymorphism. You might not have heard about it, or uh, is there anyone who has heard about it? You can probably pitch in. Okay. So and yeah. Further, yes. Awesome, awesome. Yes. Great. So you can pitch in as so well. So it's like, like uh, yeah. it is like you uh, you extract out uh, the behaviors that can work across uh, as many as types, and uh, you can plug in uh, the behaviors whenever you have new types coming. Great, awesome. Uh, that's yeah. That's like briefly what uh, he explained. We're gonna see with a simple example now. And I, you see two terms that you might not have, might not be familiar: ad hoc polymorphism and type classes. But don't worry, they're not intimidating at all. We'll see how simple they are. So, uh, type classes. Going back to our uh, monomorphic code of sorting algorithm, uh, what do you think is the heart of that sorting algorithm, or the core part of it? A comparator, right? You compare things to sort. And uh, we already have uh, a collection stored sort in Java, which accepts a comparator. And the comparator is totally generic. Uh, so the moment you want to sort strings, the collection dot sort doesn't care what you want to sort, uh, as long as you tell it uh, that this is how you compare those, right? Agree with me? So it's a simple type class. Comparator is just a type class. As simple as that. You, so we are we all are, are already using it on a day-to-day -day basis, or use have used it a lot of times, but without realizing that it's a type class. The the benefit that you get of of uh, knowing particular verbs or nouns that when you go read about other documentation or other uh, uh, other articles or libraries, you can quickly relate to what they're saying. It took me a lot of time to understand what is a type class, but in the end, it's pretty simple. No one actually. Attempted to explain that in a simpler way. At least uh, in I found one blog post wherein he actually went in and explained it in a very good manner. So uh, great. So, but what is the relationship between data type and type classes? Uh, so I, I'm going to give you a kind of formal definition, but we're going to see a quick example which kind of makes it very clear. Uh, see, type uh, in order for a data type to be a member of a type class. The data type has to support all the operations that the uh, type class offers. Okay, I know this is pretty confusing, but just uh, remember the relation that a data type can be a member of type class. That is the relationship. Now let's see how we can make a comparator. So this is the comparator, right? Uh, we all know that. Uh, I think I have missed a slide. Okay, anyways, uh, a comparator, uh, now the Apple, that you can see now is a type class, uh, is a data type. And we made the data type as a comparator, sorry, as a member of the comparator. So what did we do? We kind of implemented how to compare these two, uh, two apples. As you can see in the example, wherein I took two apples is just a comparator which returns either one or zero based on whether it's, uh, whether it's equal or not. And then the moment I implemented this concrete instance called Apple comparator, I made Apple as a member of the comparator. Now I can use that to compare apples. So as simple as that. Now you can do this with integer or string or anything, right? You, you uh, as we have discussed before. 
So, but let's try to clear uh, this. I have a question. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. I have a question. So, yeah. uh, in the uh, in this slide, right? Mm. Uh, no, this is this is more on more, more on a Kotlin syntax, okay? Because uh, I'm I'm just getting used to it. The the question mark after the Apple one, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, you you are pretending that Apple one might be null or uh, something, right? Yes, so yeah. That's, that's Correct. It. That's the reason. And the question mark followed by uh, the colon, uh, is this a ternary operator? No, it's not a ternary operator. Uh, Kotlin has something called nullables. So the moment okay. it takes Apple 1 and 2, uh, these two uh -huh. nullable types, the, uh, the, uh, the meaning of nullable is, hey, this can be null. So just like in Java, what we do, if something can be null, we do a explicit null check, wherein we do if... Yeah. Before like calling, and I was bitten by that a lot of times. I did not do a null check, mm -hmm. and I got a null pointer exception. But in Kotlin, mm -hmm. it forces you to not do that. The moment you declare mm -hmm. something as a nullable type, it only lets mm -hmm. you access with a question mark and dot. So, uh, so what happens okay. here is, uh, if Apple is mm -hmm. null, none of this will be called, and I straight away get this okay. zero back. Oh, so okay. Only, okay. only if Apple is non-null, it gets into that code. Okay, so the the let uh, the let clause followed by the Apple one is uh, is a, is a part of the syntax, right? So I can uh, uh, let's say if I want to do anything mm -hmm. uh, after uh, after I know that uh, Apple one is not null, yes. I can I can just put it inside the let statement, and uh, for because let is here is a unit type. And to extract out of the values, you are using the question mark followed by the columns. Correct, exactly. Uh, so you can say okay. in, in a different way, let me put it this way. It's just like you having a uh -huh. if, if condition, if Apple is not equal to uh -huh. null, and then you have another if uh -huh. condition, Apple to not equal to null, okay. and then inside nested if condition, you're doing this. Yeah? Okay. It's okay. just, it's a uh -huh. more idiomatic uh -huh. Kotlin. Yeah. So, uh -huh. okay. yeah. Thanks for stopping by. You can, anybody can interrupt me in between if you have any doubts. You don't have to carry till the end. Great. Uh, uh okay another question so sure, th sure. this is uh, this is uh, uh, absolutely coming from from uh, from uh, uh, from the veins of uh, the types mm -hmm. so if this is the case let's say that when you pretend that apple and uh, uh, and apple and uh, uh, for for an apple comparator mm -hmm. uh, you can you can uh, have uh, you can have the uh, app, you can have this uh, collection, uh, you can map over this collection and filter out the instances which are not uh, null, right? But uh, no, no, uh, you, the, you, I think I got the intent wrong. This comparator, uh, first of all, comes from Java. Uh, it's uh, Kotlin just takes the same Java interface from, uh, from the JDK. Okay, right? okay, okay. Then, this is uh, the comparator. The, this is a java.land.collections dot dot collections comparator, correct. right? Correct, exactly. Okay, Kotlin Kotlin okay, okay, doesn't okay. have any inbuilt comparator. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, correct, correct. Yeah, yeah correct, the correct, interface, sorry. right? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Okay. okay. Anybody else has any doubts, or shall I move on? Uh, Gopal, sorry for the interruption. No, no. We are moving at the time. Uh, let us have a question session at the end of the session. Okay. We'll go through the slides. All right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, let's create a simple type class with our own hands so we'll feel more uh, empowered. So let's say there is an adder type class. So what exactly this does is, hey, uh, I know how to add a lot of things, uh, add all the things, but you have to tell me how to add two things in your, uh, with a data type. If you tell me that, I'll add all, uh, I'll add the entire collection of your data types. So if you can see here, Add is a interface method, and there is an add all, which is a generic method, which knows how to add things. But then this add all is dependent on add, if you can see. So it is using add. So now for to actually fill this, fill the blank, what is the blank? The blank is add method here. So in order to fill the blank, we can do, we can do that for int. Let us say how to add integers. So now what I did is I implemented this interface created an object out of it, a concrete instance out of it. And then I have implemented the method add. And I said, you can do here, you can add A plus B. It's it's the, it's the what you, how you add integers. And similar, how you add strings. Uh, adding strings is concatenating with them with each other. So 
this is how i can make use of that concrete instance to actually get my uh, use my add all so what what happened is i implemented add and i got add all for free right so my analogy here is add all is a template add all is a template isn't it add all uh, has a generic and it has an algorithm uh, so this is a very simple uh, example just for the sake of our understanding but this can be extended to any level to like having multiple multitude of algorithms which are useful for multiple uh, multiple data types so but then we, going forward we're going to take it to a level up and then we're going to abstract this on fx but i'll tell you what are fx and all that stuff don't worry so i hope you got this and this is ad hoc polymorphism so 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 simple uh, uh, so nothing really great about it so before moving on i hope uh, all of you are clear about this i know we want to take questions at the last but if, to move forward we have to be clear about what we just discussed so i hope uh, nobody has any doubts i'm moving on so let's take a bit a little a little uh, a bigger example uh, this is not again big just for the context of this talk i, I want to take a simple example uh wherein this is validating an email and validating it's validating two things wherein it's uh, checking if the length of the email is less than 250 and the email contains the uh, the needle character the at character right by the way uh, this uh, there is an either here don't worry if you don't uh, know about it as of now all you have to understand is either is something which exists in two states uh, it's either a validation error or a unit in in this particular case uh, as you can see from the generics and uh, what we are doing is if the email contains this uh, sorry contains this i am going to go inside and then check for uh, if it's if the length is 250 or not and then if everything is good i'm just going to return unit uh, you can return a email as well uh, just for the sake of example if not i'm going i'm i'm just uh, returning a validation error uh, and then this last validation corresponding to the first check all right i hope you're clear by the way never uh, ever use uh, strings to represent emails always use strong types always represent using a data class this is just for the sake of example uh, okay coming back to our uh, our problem why am i calling it monomorphic because this is stuck uh, with a fail fast uh, approach what i mean by fail fast is the moment uh, the first if condition uh, fails it straight away is going to give you a validation error which is only one validation error awesome so what if i what if i have a ui so a lot of us have this use case at least we have it in our company the api there are two routes to our uh, services api and ui on the api side, i hear some background noise yeah on the api side we want to fail the api fast uh, we want to whenever there's a first validation error we want to fail it there but on the ui ui looks like a form right uh, wherein you fill out a lot of things but ui shows should show all the errors at a time so there you have to actually accumulate errors what i mean by accumulate errors is you have to show all the things that are failed so for that i have to rewrite this particular logic where it returns a list of validation errors so don't don't get into the details i'm just returning a error list in the end so but this guy is stuck with error accumulation this is a simple example imagine you have to do the same with where you have more entities and more validations more rules and all that stuff it is going to be a background where if you actually rewrite and maintenance overhead if you uh, if you add it somewhere you have to add it here as well so i don't have to explain the lot of uh, problems so how can we make this polymorphic again the same question so what do you think that makes the heart of this algorithm can anyone uh, pitch in or let me just go ahead so previous our previous uh, sorting algorithms heart is the comparator but here uh, the heart of the problem is to represent valids and invalids right uh, like what is valid and what is invalid i have to say that just like sorting what which is greater which is less and then the effect of combining all the errors this is another effect which adds up when i say combining uh, 
either I get the first validation error or I get all the validation errors. So that two effects which are uh, which are the heart of this algorithm which needs to be abstracted out. How can we abstract that out? Now I'm going to show you some code which uh, we're going to get in the end. Uh, I'm showing you the code upfront because you all have some clarity about our destination where we are going. So this is how it's going to look like. Sure, uh, it's not going to make any sense right away. And but what I'm trying to convey here is so imagine you can have loose coupling of these rules and you can compose them like this and you have a strategy called fail fast wherein you call that method. So the strategy decides whether I get all the errors or first failure. So this is similarly for error accumulation. So as simple as that. So see how lean the code has become. And now this is reusable. Now I don't, I can use the same validate email with rules for fail fast as well as error accumulation without rewriting uh, any of the validation logic as well as the orchestration logic. So this magic, uh, this is magic totally, like I said, that represented because uh, none of it makes sense as of now because we have not discussed all of that. And it's made possible because of the library called Arrow. Arrow is a Kotlin library. Uh, it, it has taken a lot of, uh, borrowed a lot of things from Scala's or uh, cats from Scala. Uh, but this uh, library takes function programming to the next level and it's a really useful library. You should go into this URL and explore what all they offer. After this talk, probably you'll have more help in trying to explore uh, because you, will, you should be able to connect all the dots easily. So yeah, let's start with some intimidating terminology again, uh, the type class arsenal. So for solving the problem that we just discussed, we need some type classes, just like we needed comparator. So, we're going to talk about a few type classes uh, and see how they actually fit into the problem. So uh, the type classes that we're going to talk today are functor, monad, applicative, applicative error. And there are many more, but these, these are the four that we're going to talk about today. Uh, these are like interfaces, just like, again, uh, I'm going to use the same analogy comparator. And these interfaces are being implemented by various data types. Uh, data types here are option either validated these are all uh, these are all data types which represent something. For example, optional is something pretty popular in Java as well as in Kotlin. Kotlin, I think uh, you don't need optional. The nullable types that we discussed before uh, replace the optional. Wherein optional just represents an effect of whether there's a value inside it or not. I hope uh, uh, anybody who has uh, been programming Kotlin coming from Java background knows it already because it's it's introduced in Java eight. So uh, option is more like a container wherein you either will have a value or not. We're gonna uh, discuss a lot uh, going forward with more pictorial representation. So it's become, it will become a lot easier. So again, this table just, just to give you an idea of what is what, uh, a, list, a list is something you must have all used uh, wherein uh, we, we can do a list.map and then we kind of provide a function wherein it uh, transforms it and that's called functor. But we're gonna get into details. I'm just giving you a high level overview of uh, what is what. A list is all three, but it's not an applicative error. An option is all, all four. And this uh, this table, we're gonna come back again. Awesome, so let's start with functor. What is a functor? Functor is uh, very simple. First of all, these uh, are divided based on the operations they support. So it's not an either or like I've shown here. Uh, a particular data type can be all four. Uh, so let's start with functor is something, anything that provides a map operation, right? Uh, what is a map operation? You have a container, uh, you have a value inside it and you want to change that value just like optional. So what you do is you supply it a function and then into his map operation and it applies it function on it, puts the value back and then uh, that's how you get the new value inside the container. So what if the container does not have any value? Simply the uh, function that you have passed is ignored. Nothing gets applied there. So that's the effect of being present or not present. So see this particular property can be used to compose functions one after the other. When I say compose function, it's like applying uh, 
functions on the value one after the other just like in this example in this pictorial example you can see you want to do a plus 2 and plus 3 on a number 10 so let's say you have two functions you pass those functions to its map operations and then you get a result 15 back so that's the use of function functor wherein uh, it provides a map operation and uh, as i've told you already list is a functor that we have discussed these terms are pretty intimidating but then in the end they end up being very simple uh, so option is again one uh, functor that we have discussed just now with the pictures <coughs> monad monad is i think the most popular term because it sounds more scarier than any other uh, type class name but monad is again so simple like i've told you uh, this is a either monad it's also called a maybe monad and it represents a state of being uh, oh sorry i'm sorry maybe is optional uh, either this is not an either monad uh, but imagine either monad in the red zone instead of uh, being nothing it has a uh, A red value. When I mean to say a left value, left or right value. So an either monad can exist in two states, like I've told. So it it can either be a validation error or it can either be a actual good result. So to represent that effect, we use either. So <clears throat> this the monad supports flat map addition in addition to map. So flat map. Why do we need flat map? Uh, when you have dependent operations to compose. again i'll come back with a simple example so imagine you have two functions both returning a wrapped value when i see when i when i say wrapped value it's a value wrapped in a container so imagine you have f1 and f2 which return you an option uh, so how do you actually compose those two you need an operation called flat map we can't do that with map and that's because uh, of other things let's not focus into their monad loss and stuff you really don't need them as a developer unless you are a library developer or something so this is monad uh, where you actually supply a value and returns a wrapped value and then you can compose those functions when after the other so this is how you can compose those functions wherein uh, and the best part is imagine where uh, if one of the uh, in the middle of one of this compositions let us say the box has turned red like uh, we have talked about uh, blue and red uh, states right let's say it turn into a red state then all the subsequent functions would just ignore it they wouldn't process they wouldn't uh, apply those functions on it so that's short circuiting for monad so uh, why do we use monads uh, monads are used for dependent operators so in this example if you can see uh, there is a user name and the guest first name uh, i hear a lot of noise yeah get first name uh, is depending on uh, depending on the username right so if you have such dependent operation wherein you need the result of your previous function for you to actually proceed you would use a monad like this a uh, simple example awesome then what is applicative uh, applicative is probably the most underrated or underheard uh, term but believe me there are more applicatives than monads uh, so let's quickly uh, understand what an applicative is now if you see there are two boxes uh, now i'll i'll compare that with what monad uh, boxes uh, or functor functor has the function outside plus 3 is outside but if the plus 3 is also inside a container a container can also contain a function functions are values of course right uh, i hope you guys know Uh, after at least coding in kotlin uh, you would get the realization java does not have it out of the box but in kotlin you can assign lambdas or pass higher order lambdas to other functions uh, so in the end functions are also values uh, you can which you can pass around so so imagine a case wherein you have a function in a box and actually a value in a box and you want to apply that function with that box so you need an operation called apply so that's what uh, applicative is but uh, why would you want to put a function inside a box uh, what is the use case we can do some interesting things like uh, we can combine two applicatives we're going to see that so with an example now applicative is used for independent operations like monad is used for dependent operations but applicative when it comes to let us say that two functions you want to get first name get get last name 
so they both written you two options and you want to actually combine these two you can't do that with map or flat map you need a special method called apply but here i'm using a method called product which internally uses apply i don't want to again get into details because apply is a little more complicated so product is a neat abstraction over apply wherein it actually does a product actual math product wherein imagine option both options are valid so what it does is it prints out a first name last name it does a product but i don't want to get into internals like i said uh, but if you're curious uh, i'll be providing code examples you can go into the code like the source code of the library and uh, always uh, explore what's going on there or you can always ping me again i'll be happy to explain for now for this particular talk uh, just understand it's just like product in maths so if it's all maths let's say you are producting a none none when i say none that's option in the red state when it doesn't have any value with sum you get none and same sum with product you get a none awesome we have talked about a lot of things uh, so meditative is not an applicable class uh, or or any type class but uh, like take a pause because we're going to shift gears and we're going to go to next level from here like the level 2 whatever you call it um, so any doubts or uh, again like i said don't go into details if you have not understood in depth you can always refer back to this recording or the uh, or the slide deck and the code examples that i'm going to provide which are going to make sense if you have understood at a high level on a, like a helicopter overview that should be sufficient anyone any doubts great uh, so we have talked about a lot of stuff and uh, we still uh, i i hope you still might be waiting what is the use why is he saying all of this uh, give me this one last moment i this one last class i want to talk about which is going to solve a problem that you have talk uh, spoken about initially that is our fail fast and uh, error accumulation which is called applicative error so we have talked about applicative now applicative error is is just like applicative just that it has an extra e in its uh, signature which represents an error and uh, it has an extra method called raise error which is similar to like uh, when you want to raise an error when there is something wrong so uh, as simple as that so as the code in the code you can see imagine either you want to set it to a left state uh, uh, we discussed what is either so all you can do is just uh, uh, do a rise error on it and uh, it gets your left state and uh, similarly option if you want a rise error it gets into a left state i mean it gets into a red state which is where it is none just in the examples and this applicative error uh, function that you're seeing here is just a companion method uh, for that particular data type which gives you an applicative instance of either so in uh, either dot applicative error gives you either applicative error uh again uh, you can go back to the source code and see how its signature is but let's not get into that now because it's going to add more confusion i hope you're clear about rising errors now <clears throat> yeah i just discussed why is it important uh, any guesses how rise error can help our validation see uh, the effect of being valid or invalid we already discussed about it uh, we have either and we also have uh, another type class called validated which is same to same to either but then it has a special property which we are going to discuss uh, next so these left representing of left and right states representing of valid invalid states is something we just discussed uh, we can do that with either and then uh, there is another thing that we did not discuss that is combining of all the validation error errors this is where the difference between either and there is another one called validated that i have shown before but we going to see it now is going to make the difference so the third one how we can actually do a strategy uh, switching so like i've said the either dot applicative error is going to give you this either applicative error class this is an interpreting signature to c but uh, just sit and uh, if you see uh, what f f belongs to either partial of and e belongs to l again uh, these are not really difficult if you just go to the source code and see what they represent it all is going to make sense i surely am uh, might uh, if this works out i can take another session to go in depth uh, once we are all comfortable with the vocabulary 
Awesome. So, so we discussed about the product, right? Product of mixing two types. So let's see what either has. Uh, so either applicative error internally uses either. All right. So if you want to combine two either's, like we discussed, it's all maths. So if you are protecting invalid with invalid, you get an invalid. Uh, if you're trying to product valid with invalid, you get an invalid, valid and invalid, invalid. Only case where both are valid, you get actual product. When I say product, uh, I'll just go back to what uh, I have shown before. Uh, <clears throat> where is this? Applicative. It's an applicator. Yeah. So as you can see, when I say product, you get both the like uh, uh, first name and last name and the product of both. Like uh, you get both a uh, 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 a first name from here, last name from here, you can concat. So what you got is a product a result which has both of the both of the values which you can make use of to create another value. So you have A, you have B, you can create C out of it. So similarly, uh, we just saw either product, but when it comes to validated, it has a different property. The product implementation of validated is different. So how different is it? So when you're producting invalid into invalid, instead of uh, just letting it being invalid, it actually adds up to whatever invalid state it has before, which means let us say I'm invalid one, I have error one, and you're trying to product me with something error two. What happens is you get error one plus error two. So that's the property which differs uh, either from validated. So, uh, and when it's both valid and invalid, it just adds those first errors, which is similar to what either does. And when both are valid, it's a product, actual product of what you have. So we can make use of these two strategies, two uh, effects of uh, either and validator to actually get to our uh, sol solving a problem. All right. So, uh, so what happens the fail fast can we uh, we can use either dot applicative error for our fail fast right because uh, now for a fail fast our rules our validations are returning either that we have seen before now if i want to product an either two either's uh, i hope i am making sense or if i am not at all making sense please interrupt me if it's too high if it's going above your head uh, All right, uh, I silence is either ways I, I, I can I can see that. Uh, but like I said, I'm, I can take another session probably. Uh, once this is, uh, this is just a high level overview. Okay. Uh, and then error accumulation can be, we can use validated applicative error for accumulation. So in the end, this is uh, the same code that we have seen before. When I call this validated email rules with these strategies, this validated email rules is an extension function uh, in Kotlin. Again, the, that's a different subject to, uh, to discuss. I hope you guys know about extension functions. So uh, again, let's not get into the what part, how this code works. Uh, imagine you're reading an English sentence, that's it. Uh, so uh, to understand the code, you have to spend some time. I was there, it was hard. Uh, like uh, when I was learning for the first time, I, I totally uh, vouch your condition if you feel uh, this is really complicated, but just imagine you're reading an English sentence. So what you're seeing is, hey, run this validation in fail fast mode. And uh, for this, I have taken uh, the fail fast is this that we have seen before. I was using uh, either applicative error. That's the effect here. And uh, when I'm uh, doing accumulation of errors, I'm using this validator of applicative error. So Let's just revise back from where to where we have traveled. Like we started with a simple one called comparator. Right? A comparator has a simple method uh, compare. And the moment I have implemented that compare, I got all the templates uh, for free. Now the concrete instances here are either dot applicative, just like the concrete instance of compare that we did ourselves. Uh, either dot applicative error comes from the library. Library itself gives you with all the, like the major uh, just like in, in comparator, we are concerned about the compare function, right? So in these two, we are concerned about the product function that we have seen before. How the product is done, we have seen with the matrix. 
So the product function make the difference between these two. And then when I actually just like how uh, I have supplied this concrete instance to collections dot sort um, of the Java, where Java actually make use of this, I'm similarly supplying this concrete instance to our validate email with rules function, but in a different way. I'm using a extinction function, but that's not important. Uh, you all you have to understand is how I'm supplying this concrete instance to my algorithm. My algorithm here is this validate email with rules. So, and then uh, these are the rules. Uh, again, these are extinction functions. As you can see, the rules are using the raise error that we have discussed before to actually convey that, hey, this guy is not valid. And uh, don't get into what is NEL and all that stuff. Uh, like you can go and explore about NEL or I can again take a session and get into details. So, you, when, uh, so the rules are raising errors and these uh, errors when raised, depending on the instances that I have supplied, they either be accumulated or they're fail fast. So the effect is in control, not the, not the developer uh, who has written the code is in control. So what did we get out of this, right? And now this and this are common. Uh, imagine you have 100 such validations we have in our code base. So you, you get them all off for free uh, for both UI and uh, let us say uh, a service. So imagine this is like the entry point of your service. You can just call the entire set of uh, algorithm or entire set of validations just by passing, just by giving it, uh, hey, I want to do fail fast declaratively. And on the UI side, let us say this is the entry point where you get given an error accumulation as the entry point. Awesome. So that's it. Uh, we're done for today. That, that's what I was, I was trying to show you. Like I said, this is totally a high level overview of giving you the sense of what the idea is. And there is, we can also do this with DB operation concluded it. Just few slides at the last, like I love to hear feedback from you guys. Please uh, DM me on Twitter or email. And you can see the code here, this is the URL. Uh, like I said, the recording will be shared so you don't have to note it down. Please, please star on the GitHub. Uh, I know I'm sounding like an Uber driver, but then the stars really help to bring this repository out uh, to other guys as well. And then this is a Slack channel that we as a functional programming enthusiasts and other full stack developers, we have this channel. I'm just cross promoting it in this. So if you love to join, you can uh, note down this URL and uh, you can join there to have more discussions about functional programming. Thank you so much.